Preparing. Okay, and we are live. Good evening. I would like to welcome you to our last lecture of the autumn and winter season of Chalanko Mini Lectures. Uh, I would like to introduce you to uh, Sofia Forsen. Hello. Hello. Who is uh, an artist and also professor um, and who will speak about her recent work. Uh, also, if you have any questions, you can ask them through the comments on our YouTube channel. And I'm going to read them after the lecture. So now it's all yours, Sophia. And have a nice evening with us. Thank you very much. And thank you very much also for the invitation. Um, I was very happy to be asked to uh, talk in this series. Of course, um, I would very much prefer actually to be in, in with Nadlabem and uh, not on the Zoom, but given the circumstances, it is, this is really also a very good option. Um, I will be talking about four to five works, uh, most of them very recent, but one of them a little bit older. And um, I, as you see, I have called the talk, The Shape of a Hole in the Ground, on the coming and going of objects and stories. These are all uh, site-specific works and in different ways, they all deal with uh, presence and absence uh, of, with disappearance, with some kind of object that has been lost or which is not uh, there anymore or not really in reach. In my work, as in the public and, and site-specific works, as well as in my exhibitions and, and more sort of institutional works, I am often attracted to things that are ephemeral, on the edge of disappearing, uh, of something which is just the print of something which is not there anymore. Um, something, sometimes it's almost like a wanting of this thing that has disappeared to be there again. Um, I somehow in my work try to hold on to it, or to bring it back, or to keep it in my hands just for a short moment, even if, of course, it cannot be really actually re reinvented or taken back. You will see more about that in the actual works. Um, when I do site-specific work, as these works are that you're going to see, I usually hope that they will have some kind of relevance for the site that they can be of some kind of use, uh, that they contain some kind of story that can actually be read out of the actual installation. But it's not so important that the viewer knows anything about the background. It is always okay to just see it as it is and understand it or misunderstand it. I think those are the conditions that we always work under and that is how you have to also accept that works are working when you're not there yourself. Um, I will, in this, uh, this presentation, I'll always start with uh, showing you the actual works and try to explain what you're actually seeing and what is uh, there, uh, since we can't go there ourselves. And then I will try to unfold them and uh, tell you about the background and about some of the decisions and processes that led to uh, how they actually ended up looking. As um, already said, of course, don't hesitate to ask questions and also to ask me to clarify uh, things for later if something has been unclear. So I will start with work which is actually a pretty old work, but it is a work that I still very much appreciate that I quite like. And of course, I also show it because it um, was the first time I actually visited Ustina Labem and uh, also the only work that I've actually done in your town. It's from 2006 to 2008. It has two sequences, as you will see. And um, as you see here on the picture, it is in a way a very straightforward wall painting. You will probably recognize it um, as it is, as a fragment of something which is actually in the town. I don't think this wall exists anymore. And I think it's pretty much near to the academy. It's next to a pretty large street where many cars come into town and where you uh, 
will stop. There is a red light a little bit further down, so you will be slowing down when you pass it. But it's definitely not a prominent place. It's a modest situation. There's a bus stop, as you will see later. And um, it is really also not a place where anybody will come traveling to see this work. It's not an institutional situation. It's not near any kind of cultural institution. It's not in the center of really anything. Um, so what you see is a white background with a drawing painted in a rather sketchy and fast way, but enough to sort of transfer sort of the graphic quality of the image. And after a while, after two years, the black lines were painted over with the same white as used in the original background. But of course, over the, those two years, you will see that the, the background paint has become brown from the pollution, from the dust, from the city, from time. And uh, the white lines, which two years ago would have made just a white spot out of it, suddenly stands out pretty clearly and it becomes a negative image of the original image. Of course, those of you who know the city will recognize this as a section of, uh, of this mosaic, which is at the center of the town on, on the town hall building. And you will, you will see that it's the midsection with the, the house in the middle and the mining equipment that has been sort of taken out and transferred to this particular piece of wall. Now, when I was invited to do this uh, to do this work, it was also the first work that I did um, together with Michal Kolicek, and um, which was already then a wonderful collaboration. So when I was invited to do this work, I was at the time very interested in uh, mosaics. I was interested in art and public space. And since I live in Vienna, and Vienna is, as you might know, a city which was pretty bad badly damaged in the Second World War and had a lot of rebuilding in the 50s and 60s. You will also maybe know that these buildings from this period of time, from the 50s and 60s, have a lot, but really a lot of public artworks. They have scafiti, they have mosaics, they have so many wall-bound works. And at this time, I was uh, very interested in this this kind of, of art and public space. And I was interested in the narrativity of it, the stories that the uh, cities tells about, tell about themselves on, on these kinds of, of, uh, of uh, public artworks. And that was part of a larger research. In Vienna, you will very often in these uh, post-war works find images of rebuilding. There's a lot of brick and mortar. There's a lot of construction work, but of course there are also um, images of simply the life of the people and whatever kind of topics that you would want to sort of transmit to the to this to the population in in these early post-war years. Also, these works were in Vienna very much a part of a, of a, an effort to give work to artists who, of course, had very little possibilities to actually exist in in, in these years, and uh, which is another one, one of the reasons why there are so, so many. So my eyes were attuned to this kind of, of work and I came to Usti and I saw this mosaic and was on one hand quite attracted to the graphical qualities of this drawing. It's a mosaic, but it is of course also very much a drawing. And um, then of course, it's also really, really gigantic. I mean, now, uh, preparing for this uh, lecture, I was doing a little bit of research on, on, on this. Again, it turns out, I didn't know that back then, that it's uh, at least one of the biggest mosaics in, in, in Europe, which is not, if, if not one of the biggest mosaics worldwide, it is gigantic. But what also attracted me was obviously this odd picture in the middle of this little house somehow under this mining tool. And then you might see it very vaguely in this image, the fact that the, 
the stones around the house are a little bit lighter. And uh, Michael told me, and we also found out after doing a little bit of research in the library, that um, this section had been uh, replaced. The mosaic itself was built in uh, 85 or finalized in 85 by Miro Schlagura. And um, the original version, you can see it him standing on, on the sketch, the gigantic sketch for the work here. Um, and as you see in the middle, there is not a little house, there is a white field, which actually contained a piece of text. And this piece of text was an excerpt from the Communist Manifest. And it was after 89, it was removed. In uh, 97, the city wanted to change it and Hura was uh, um, ready to redesign the center of the piece and he also did with the little house. Um, so now we have this situation. I was curious about that at the time because in addition to my, my, uh, my, um, my work on public art and mosaics and these kinds of interests. I had also been uh, doing several uh, site-specific projects in, around Leipzig in the years from 2003 to 2006. And one of the really, really central aspects of my interest at that point was the single family house. The extreme growth of uh, single family houses around these Eastern German uh, villages and also of course the relation between the house and the and the brown coal mining is of course also in Bohemia is, is a fact that uh, a lot of villages a lot of uh, um, urban situations or suburban or more, uh, rural communities have been removed or somehow very very influenced by by the brown coal mining so that was something that I found curious that you had this kind of mining tool and under it you have the house. And then I also found it really, really curious that to shift this manifest with the single family house. At the time, it seemed to me as some kind of um, manifestation of the actual, actual, absolutely individual way of living in the single family house at the center of this mosaic after um, 89. And I found that an interesting choice now, after uh, researching for this lecture, I learned something more because the thing is, when we did this research in, in 2006 and 2008, it was not quite as easy to find its information as it, is, as it is now. We found a few books in the library, but uh, now I learned that this house was actually modeled by the childhood home of the artist. So it was a much more individual and much more um, personal choice to put this house there. And this kind of shifts my view on this mosaic a little bit today. And it also um, makes maybe the scenery in a strange way seem to me even a little bit more threatening with, with these big circling wheels of, of the mining machine over the house. It's, it's a strange uh, image and I haven't really come to some kind of final conclusion of how I read it or how, how I understand it. And of course, me being Danish, living in Denmark and not speaking Czech can also only have like a rather limited uh, understanding of what this is. But nonetheless, I found it very interesting as a choice of this mosaic, if we go back to the full one, what it shows is the history of Bohemia starting from ancient middle age times and ending up in some kind of uh, sunshine um, um, wonder world up in the sky. And you have all these kinds of historical developments and, and relevant parts of the local history depicted in this, this work. And, and in that way, I found it curious and also really interesting that he chose to put this house there in the middle. So what I wanted to think about with this particular 
section taken out was of course the house itself and its relation to the mining and these kind of sweeping lines in the landscape and the industrial elements and the train cars on the side and the factories below. But I also um, wanted to make this section sort of being continued by being sort of repainted by the city and by the air itself. So that we in the end end up with this kind of uh, ghost image as a way of uh, continuing a little bit or maybe a small fragment of the history that is actually told on the mosaic. I brought this uh, work today because I still like it very much. And um, in many ways, it's sort of in, holds a number of the methods that I like to use when I'm working, the way it sort of, um, on the one hand, relates to the to the site, to the place, to this city, but also tells with other media than just the, the, the image itself. This is of course a work, and this is something that I'll probably speak about later as well, that is really very much for a local audience. I mean, you can understand it or you can relate to it, of course, just seeing it, but for most people, there will be an element of recognition. And of course, it's a work that counts upon the people sitting in the cars coming down this road, recognizing it and maybe spending a few seconds thinking about what does these transformations actually mean. So now I take a jump into time to a work which is in a way less site specific, but built for a very particular situation. It's a um, work called Ballspielwende, in German that means wall for playing balls. And it's a series of component sculptures that are placed on the sports grounds, on the playgrounds of a high school in Krems in Austria. And it was uh, done in the context of uh, um, big art, which is uh, the state holding of buildings. When they renovate or build something new, they always include uh, new artworks in, in the buildings. And um, this is a series of um, balls for playing walls on. There are five of them. You can see three of them here. And here is the fifth one. Uh, the high school was a building from the 50s that was renovated and had some additions. And um, one of the central elements of the actual architecture was that everything was to be very, with a lot of very transparent, the glass the classrooms have glass walls. So you always have these kind of uh, perspectives and uh, views. You can look into the classrooms. You can always have a, an overview of what is going on in the architecture in these spaces. So, and, and in Austria high school, I don't know if that's way, the way it is also in the Czech Republic, but um, High school is from 10 to 18, so these are teenagers, as you can also see in this image. So I thought, among other things, that one of the things that you also want to do when you are a teenager, you want to maybe have a sit to hang or sit, a place to hang or a place to hide, a place where, where you're possibly not so visible from the center, central eye of the school and the teachers and the headmasters and your friends. But also, um, I wanted to make something that you can actually use, that you can sit on, that you can play on, that you can um, do different things with. These walls relate very strongly to some of the research I was talking about before, because while I was uh, looking at all these works in public space, I was looking at the, uh, the walls and the mosaics in Vienna and all these different narratives, in some of the publications I was using, I also came across images like this one. And in opposition to the actual uh, mosaics and graffiti and wall paintings, these were not there anymore. And there was a whole number of them, of play sculptures, obviously done for playgrounds, always with the children doing stuff on them. But a lot of them were also like really, really interesting and quite attractive and, and, and uh, 
for that time, uh, very uh, abstract works. And you have to remember, this is like late 50s, or early 60s, at the time where there was not so much abstract art in public space in, in, uh, in Vienna. So this was the uh, initiation of a research which was like a very large part of my work for a few years from 2011 to, to like 15, uh, which circled really mainly around these, uh, these, these no longer existing place sculptures. I wanted to find out who did them, where did they go and how did these artists think about working so abstractly and how, uh, how well connected were they to international uh, place culture movements? Because as you might know, the place culture and the idea of, of the child and the child engaging bodily with the art was a very sort of internationally prominent thing in, in the, throughout the 50s and 60s. And here I suddenly had these not very well described or well known uh, Austrian examples. So in my research, I found out that a lot of these were done by, there was a number of artists who did, not but a very large part was done by an artist called Josef Seebacher, who um, especially, this is, this is by him, and this is also by him, and he, he have these sort of very clear abstract forms, uh, modular systems that are sort of varied and recombined in many ways and used on a large, large number of, of the playgrounds throughout the city. But of Bach's works, nothing exists anymore. Of other artists, there are just a few that are still left. And this is, of course, maybe also why nobody ever wrote about them or did much research about them at the time when I started looking at them, because um, they were gone. They were simply not present in the city anymore. And among these, slides and climbing sculptures, there were also a series of walls to pay balls all on, like this one, uh, with a sort of a rather relatively complex and very nice uh, um, painting, or like this one from, this is relatively late, early 70s, or like these by Seebacher. So the, this research, developed into a number of different works. I will show you one more, a part of the, apart from the, the, the walls later on, but these particular walls were of course in themselves interesting, but also I had sort of the feeling that it would be great to sort of reactivate them and reinvent them and, and have them sort of relived again as a, as a possibility to actually use and play for for, for kids today. So a lot of these elements, shapes, forms are sort of reintroduced, reused in, in these walls. They are updated to sort of current security um, aspects because of course a lot of these old worlds, works, worlds would not have been possible today. They are simply not uh, acceptable anymore because of, of their size and scale and um, reintroduced on this, uh, on this school playground. So you have these different shapes, you have the numbers, which are also uh, taken from one of the walls you saw. And you have, uh, of course, the possibility to play, but also to sit and hang like the two girls over there in, in the corner. Oops. One of the elements that was also important while thinking of, uh, of this work is that the school itself has uh, sports as a, uh, a central part of their actual um, um, curricula. So they have very large sports grounds. And I also wanted the walls because of this, I wanted the walls to be like, not for any specific game. I mean, if you know teenagers, you know the teenagers constantly have to move. They constantly have to sort of bounce against something. There is, if there is a hole to shoot a ball through, they will probably do it at some point. But I wanted 
this particular section of, of the sports grounds to be sort of with no defined game, with no defined specific use, with no defined and specific spaces where you could more or less sort of reinvent it from day to day. So from what I hear, it's still very much in use and works pretty okay, exactly as it was planned. And um, of course, it's, uh, it's, quite a, it's, it's quite a luxury to be able to do something that is this permanent. However, this particular series of works, as you saw before, started actually departing from a series of old photographs, archival photographs of something that doesn't exist anymore. And this motif of the archival, pho archival photograph, which is really not an object, which is just a flat photograph, possibly even online, possibly even digital and not something you can actually touch, is uh, something that keeps coming back to me. I like to think of these walls as some kind of giant archival sheets of forms as if they had been sort of taken out of the photograph and really uh, enlarged to a very large scale. So they are like very heavy sheets of paper, but of course they are also simply concrete objects standing on a playground. This is another section of the play sculpture series and I was originally not planning to, to introduce it, to take it into the presentation today, but I decided to because this motif of the photograph is something that we'll be coming back to. What you see here is, um, again, of course, derived out of the archival photo photographs of the place sculptures. Um, this is some kind of abstracted jungle gym. It is just exactly so big and dimensioned in a way that you, as a viewer, you know that you could probably not swing around it yourself, it would be too heavy. But what is actually hanging on this jungle gym or this kind of, of uh, climbing uh, structure are enlarged photographs of the actual uh, original uh, sculptures. And of course, if you photograph, if you take a photograph and you print it out very large, you will have a soft piece of paper. It will probably roll, it will move, it will um, move in the wind when you pass by it. And it will become in a sort of very ephemeral and temporary way, a body on its own. So that is what I wanted to, to do with this particular installation. I wanted to sort of give back these objects, uh, a temporary kind of body, something which is fragile and can break, maybe just like history itself, if you don't take very much care about it. Um, and it is something that, you know you will be able to roll up or throw away or dismiss very easily. It's not permanent. So this installation, which is uh, modular, just like the work of Josef Seebacher was, um, has been shown in different situations. This is from an exhibition in Vienna, in an exhibition play space called Tresor at the Kunstforum Bank Austria in 2013. But I have uh, shown it in different contexts. And sometimes the photographs shift, change to different situations. These are not all uh, Viennese uh, place sculptures that are hanging from the poles. Some of these are international ones. The one you see just in the front here is an, uh, a place sculpture by uh, Isamu Noguchi, which was uh, very important. For, for also my thinking about how place cultures play an, 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 an essential role in, in also in relation to abstract sculpture. And here is uh, one smaller version of the work, which was actually in a show um, in Ustinat Labem also in 2013. So you see it's a section of the larger installation with, uh, with two sculptures hanging. So from here, we move on to, an, uh, to an, uh, an exhibition and a, uh, a project I did in uh, Prague. 
in 2018. And it's a temporary site-specific installation. It was uh, part of a larger exhibition in public space. Um, it's a festival returning every two years called M3 Art and Space. And this particular version was uh, called Traces of Time, vice versa, our Earth is the Moon, the Moon is their Earth. And um, with this, I'll spend a little bit of time because it's, it's relatively complex in the way it, it, it's, uh, it, it developed. It was a project which was uh, curated by Jan Kratokwil and, and uh, Laura Amann and um, organized by, by the Art Center in Prague called Bubec. So I, I'm very thankful that we were actually able to realize this work because this was no easy project. So what you see here is three sort of uh, relatively large lumps of concrete lying in the courtyard of a shopping mall. The site is uh, the Florentinum shopping contact, com complex, shopping and office business complex, which is next to the Masaryk station in Prague. If you look at this image, and if you wouldn't have sort of the Czech text in the background, this could be anywhere. This is really like an example of uh, absolute non-space architecture, corporate architecture, like you would find it in very, very many places in the world. Um, when, so, and the, the sculptures in opposition to the, to the architecture around them are pretty rough. They have sort of, uh, rough and slightly dirty surfaces and, and they're painted in brown and red tones like earthy tones that that maybe brings to mind something which is the absolute opposite of the architecture around them the people coming to this place is uh, are of course shoppers but the shopping part of, of the complex is not so big. So mainly the people who will be in the courtyard are uh, workers from the offices in the buildings around them. Among others also uh, Penta Developing, which is uh, the company that owns this complex and which is also um, responsible for, for the development, which is where these objects actually come from. So as you see in the background, you have people sitting smoking or phoning, that will be office workers and they'll probably be sitting on these benches having smoke several times a day. So this is like really also my very, very local audience to this, to this work. The large black building on the left is the actual shopping complex and the courtyard is behind this wall. On the right, you have the Masaryk uh, station. And in the middle, there's a large hole, which is uh, the building plot where there will be a large uh, business complex designed by Zaha Hadid Architects. So this is this, the time of the exhibition, which was in the summer of 2018. And this is a viewing platform where you can go up and you can look into the construction site, which is something that a lot of people really like to do. This is a very sort of uh, prominent and, and uh, also quite published uh, project. And, uh, oh, sorry, yeah. It's, um, it is uh, going to be a huge, 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 building which goes all the back, way back to the highway and will contain offices and shopping and restaurants and uh, very much define the whole area. But when we started the research for the project or looking for sites and trying to figure out what to do where and who could do which work, there were a lot of artists involved in this exhibition, it looked like this. Because in Prague, as in many cities, if you want to do a large development, you are obliged to do a thorough archaeological um, excavation first in order to secure, of course, the knowledge and, and the layers that are um, under the building that you're planning to build. Because the moment you build the actual building, all this will be gone and this uh, knowledge will disappear. So when we were looking for sites, I found this and fell completely in love with this situation of 
actually being able to see so many layers of the city. The area that they are excavating is an, um, is a, is a, is a neighborhood from the late 15th century and just on the edge of that, what used to be the outer wall of, of Prague. And so in this situation, you have old walls and then you have the street and you have the turn of the century buildings like the, the, the yellow building in the middle, you have a little bit of later building uh, like the red and gray one on the, on the, on the, on the left. And you have the large, um, large shopping complex, which is where the developer who's also developing the Saadi project is sitting. So I pretty soon decided that I wanted to work with, with this situation. I wanted to do something with this. And in a way, it's, um, it's, like, a, it's like a very, very slow performance taking place over several months where the ground is permanently changing. You have the diggers digging and working and moving around in, in, this, in this hall. Certainly, permanently new layers are sort of opened up. And if you go there regularly, you always find the situation changing and moving. You have these incredibly beautiful shapes. That was the second thing I fell in love with. The actual negative sculptures, you could maybe say, that these holes in the ground are. Of course, they are not random. Um, the archaeologists dig where they found certain kinds of patterns and they um, have reasons to look for specific things. But nonetheless, you have these very, very intriguing and beautiful situations. And in a way, I really, really wanted to sort of just keep all these shapes and keep keep all these uh, holes, which of course is not possible because they are permanently uh, shifting. So, I mean, look at these, aren't these absolutely beautiful? So what I decided to do was to cast a number of these holes and have them reproduced in concrete and put them in the courtyard of the, of the, um, of the Florentinum uh, business complex. So this is basically what we're doing here. We're taking a plaster cast of, of the holes together with a group of students from the sculpture department at the Academy in Prague. It was really fantastic that they could uh, uh, do this job for us. And then uh, of course these, later these casts were taken out and taken out and, and uh, reproduced in concrete somewhere else. This is how it looks. It was a quite a challenge uh, to do this work because of course, when you do this kind of uh, work, you come in in the middle of the process. The excavation was already, already going at high speed and uh, there were time limits and, and deadlines for everything. And, and we had, they were, everybody was very, very helpful. The archeologists were really doing their best to, to, to uh, help us do this work. But of course there were, time limits to everything and, and several times we had the situation of deciding for a hole that we wanted to cast and then I would get a call that um, it had to be moved because the developer had had to do uh, to change some things or shift some earth and the actual hole had disappeared so it was really like a chase after time and trying to just sort of keep some of these for just a moment um, but we were able to cast a number of these and reproduce them. Here is the plaster cast. Here is the concrete before being painted while being sort of stripped of the plaster. And, uh, and before it was painted and put back into the courtyard. This is actually my favorite piece, like this little strange flat one. In addition to the casts, uh, there was another part of the work which was uh, this was shown on two also existing structures in, in the complex. In the hallway of, the, of the, the developer's building, there was like a waiting area downstairs. We can see these red chairs. And uh, on the wall of this hallway, there was a, uh, a screen. The screen would usually show sort of a news 
news with uh, no sound on it would just be with subtitles or nothing altogether. And it would be sort of sitting strangely on this uh, little wall. So we were able to be, or we were allowed to use the screen for the duration of the, of the, of the exhibition for a video work. And the video work is also silent and very, very slow and is nothing but a, let's see if it's moving, a number of uh, close up images of, uh, of some of the holes in the excavation, of some of these sort of uh, sculptural situations and images that I felt so much in love with, but also later on, as you will see, some of the things that were actually taken out of the ground in this uh, situation. They all film very close up. You don't have much context. And as you can probably imagine, I've been also very interested in simply the actual surfaces, the colors, the, the way they are layered on top of each other, these different layers of earth and, and, and color, and also sometimes the tools and, and the plastic, plastic baskets and boxes that are used um, in, in this process of, process of excavating. Um, and the film is uh, seven minutes. I'm not showing you all of it, of course, because it's, it's obviously not a work that is uh, meant to be uh, seen from beginning to end, unless you're waiting for somebody in this area. Um, it ends with uh, these images where you actually see some of the shards and things that are taken out of the ground and some of the process that comes out after, after actually excavating. I think in a way very much about this work also as a work for a very sort of a local audience, let's say the people who work in this place, because they will have seen this excavation taking place all the way from the beginning till the complete disappearance. And uh, they will of course look at this in a different way than if they look at it at all, than uh, the, the people who might come from the outside to see the exhibition um, as a whole. So, oops. Okay, I'm sorry, I thought I had a final image of the actual courtyard. So in a way, I think very much of uh, these objects in the courtyard, let me just go back to them, as uh, I'm sorry about this, as uh, shards in themselves, like the shards you saw in the video, like fragments that are actually lying there and fragments of the process that has led to this sort of empty hole. Um, of course, you could say that maybe there is also a certain melancholy connected with uh, the disappearance of this actual site. In a way, of course, I there is a certain kind of loss of all these uh, things that are simply now erased from this plot. But I'm actually not so so interested in, in um, being particularly critical of the Sahadi development itself. It is a fact it will happen. And um, I think I was at this moment mostly really, really desiring to hold on to the situation of the excavation for just a moment. So sorry for the back and forth. I hope you will me on this one. So this work is, um, wait a second, sorry. This work is a relatively recent work. Sorry, I'm sorry about the presentation back and forth. This work is called Strokes and Incisions and it's um, a site specific installation that um, was uh, finished in 2020, last year, as a uh, part of uh, Rijeka 2020. It was also a project curated by Michael Kolicek. And uh, he, it was part of an exhibition 
or let's say a project with uh, 10 permanent works that were to be established around the Kwana Bay, which is a bay around um, Rijeka. It was a very big project in terms of also geographically, because these works would be partly very, very far from each other. And um, my work is uh, placed in Brzec, which is a tiny village, like half an hour outside of Rijeka. And um, it consists of uh, three large limestones that are in a way benches, but they are also very large drawings. They have uh, on the surface a carving of a pattern of sort of abstract lines and scratches. And um, that are maybe not really easy to read at the first sight. And that is also really not so necessary for the person coming from the outside. An important part of the of the project was um, or the work is the boccia court in the background, and um, which is um, the original boccia court in the village. If some of you know Croatia, you will also know that boccia is uh, a very very important game in in the country and still is in many villages. So in this work, it is um, an essential part of, of the actual work. So here is Michael looking at the drawing. And here is a close up. I'll show you some more close ups later. This is Presec. Presec is an absolutely beautiful little town uh, on the coast. You can see sort of the medieval um, center uh, with around the church. It's sort of very dense. And if you zoom in, you can see this triangular spot with the Boccia Court, which is uh, the site where the work ended up being placed. You can see it's just at the entrance of the village where you will uh, maybe park your car or stop before you, you go to uh, one of the nearby restaurants. And um, this is the site before we place the work. So there is the Boccia Court, which is uh, had not been renovated for very long and it is not used very often um, or has probably not been used for years. And, uh, and you have this kind of site, which is a little bit than a non-space. You have these two benches, but otherwise there is nothing really there. <clears throat> oh, I'm sorry about this. What is this? Yeah. So um, when I was uh, invited, the primary premise was um, that the school in this village had just closed the year before. The public school, the primary school, had been working for 170 years, 75 years, and had closed after having too few students. It had only seven students in the last class. And uh, of course, that was not viable in the long term. So it was closed. And of course, if any of you come from, from small towns where the school has been closed, I do myself, you know that that is a really, really hard hit to a community because it feels as if sort of the center or some kind of really important heart of, of the village has been, been stopped. And this was also the case here. So the original idea was that maybe I would think about something that related to the school. As you can see, Versace is like just this wonderfully beautiful little town. And of course, it was also in a way intimidating as a, an artist. I mean, I come there, there is this incredibly beautiful situation as a village in itself. And what should I add? How can I, what can I find that I can, can that can contribute to some kind of situation in this, in this actual place? So when I start this kind of, 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 um, of work, it, it's very much also about trying to figure out what are the narratives, what are the kind of materialities, what could possibly have some kind of meaning in this situation. And in this case, it became very much sort of a um, combination of, of things that grew out uh, after visiting a number of times and, and thinking about the place and looking at it. So of course there is a school at the center of the city. So even if the work was not to be placed in this 
courtyard uh, where really nothing more is needed. It is still in a way at the center of the narrative. And then something else that I was thinking about while walking around was what is what does permanent mean? What does a permanent work do? And what does permanence mean? What does it mean to hold something for a long time? So I, I, I was looking at some of the letters that are carved in the in the in the buildings, the numbers, the house numbers, little uh, informations that have uh, different meanings. And more than anything, I was interested, of course, in the format of the stone carving. Oh, and then here to the right, there is a, uh, a gateway into a, a path through. And on this, in this sort of uh, passage, there is a wall which has obviously not been painted or renovated for very many years. It looks like this. It's um, it's it's a wall full of uh, very sort of uh, fast graffitis. People have writing been writing the names. Um, you see, it says Kruger. Somebody has been writing 1975. Somebody was there in 1975. Um, there is even a. Somebody loves somebody somewhere, and, and you have all these kind of random scratchings and peeling paint and traces of, of time. And nobody could really tell me who had been doing this or if it, it had been sort of a hangout for, for anybody. And I guess it's just really a mix of tourists and teenagers and kids and whatever who have been riding into this wall for many years. And of course, if you do this kind of scratching, you know that it's not meant for eternity, but at the same time, it's also very much about leaving a mark. So that was something that I kept coming back to while visiting. These are some of the kids that live in the village. They don't go to the school anymore. They would have if it still had existed. So in the framework of, of the researchers, we managed to meet up with some of these kids and we also managed to visit the school building together with them. Um, they showed me some of their school works and we also found a cupboard full of old school books which had for some reason not been emptied as the school when the school was emptied and um, some of the kids found their old school work from a few years before. We actually ended up finding um, a school book by, this is the one, by a guy called uh, Luca. Uh, Luca is uh, now a grown up. He's a naval engineer and he works in Holland. But his mother used to be the, and he was very helpful for the, for the, for the whole project. He was uh, one of the people that, that helped with information and, and, and context. And it turns out that his mother used to be the teacher of the school. So in this cupboard full of, uh, school books. We found, um, I'm sorry, I have to move somewhere. So we found information, we found, um, of course, images and, and uh, stories, things like, like this. I don't know if you see my small picture. Um, and I just have to go back to here. And with this conglomeration of, um, um, of images from the school books, little drawings, uh, scratches from the, from the wall, and different kind of information. I produced the three drawings that are now on the stones. So they are really an abstract uh, drawing that combines a number of the traces that were to be found in the city or in the village. So now what you have is a number of drawings that cannot be read just like that. But that also doesn't matter because even if these two kids jumping and running on them, they have no idea and it's not their school book and they're just visiting. Uh, it is still also a bench. It's somewhere you can sit. It's somewhere where you can sit and look for your car keys before you get into your car. Somewhere where, where your child will be jumping around while you still finish dinner on the restaurant in the restaurant on the other side of the street. So it has this kind of functionality and 
probably only the 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 inhabitants of the village know the narratives some of them will e even know that those particular lines they come from my drawing but it has it can be used on in different levels the boccia court was renovated that was a very important part of, of of the work for me to sort of try to reactivate it and maybe it can be used by some people maybe it will be used by people who live there maybe it'll be used by people who visit um, and of course, I also uh, gladly admit that a part of it was also very much my desire, my me wanting to do these uh, to do these drawings, to uh, uh, make this kind of abstract picture, and to try to to somehow keep something permanent that is an actual that was actually thought to be very ephemeral and not lasting because I mean who of us have ever looked at our math pages from second grade ever again but some of them are in here and they are held for a moment and I was uh, very privileged to all to be able to do this kind of, of, of uh, drawing and work so as you also see, it will be, it'll get dirty from the earth and the rain will clean it up again and it will have this kind of permanence and or it's permanently changing. And at the same time, of course, also um, with time, the, peel, the paint will peel and go away. Maybe at some point these stones are taken away and used for something else. I don't know, we will see. One of the persons who helped me very much with the, uh, speaking to local people with Eva Galovic and she sent me these images of the summer of 2020 where the York, as it is called, the, the, the Boccia Court, was in fact the place to be. It seemed to be working at least for that summer and there were several parties and picnics and things going on. So we are uh, moving towards uh, finishing. I had have one more work where I'll just uh, show you some uh, images. It's a very recent exhibition. It's actually still up. And um, I wanted to include it because in many ways it relates to the other two works. It is um, at the Sculpture Hall at the Funen Art Academy where I also work. I'm a professor at this academy and at the moment we have a series of uh, faculty exhibitions of which I could do one. And um, the building used to be the former museum, the former museum of archaeology and art and art history and, and natural history um, opened, which was built in the around the, the ninth, beginning of the 19th, 20th century. So even if the building itself is now a um, an art academy it has of course still the air of being a museum and that was something that i wanted to sort of recall in this uh, presentation or in this installation so what you see here is uh, really a number of boxes let's say frames that make rooms inside the room that are maybe vitrines, maybe they are more the pedestals. They have this kind of in-between situation. They display things, but they also can't really display them. And the things are sort of unruly and try to leave them. Even in the whole exhibition space, some objects sort of creep towards the walls and try to not sort of accept the boundaries of this very uh, dominant space. And, um, what you see on these sheets of paper are rubbings of, again, um, objects that are not here anymore. Those are rubbings of photographs of some of the archaeological objects that went into the collection of the museum around the time when the house was built. So with this work, I was uh, hoping to sort of to call back some of the objects that are not in the house anymore and try to make a connection between some of the things that used to be there into a house which is now being used to be 
to produce completely new art by all the students who are studying here. I will uh, end here with this image. And um, if there are any questions, please ask me. Well, thank you very much for your lecture. Uh, actually, unfortunately, we don't have any questions, but <clears throat> I would like to thank you for your talk because for me as a PhD student who has research based on site specific installation, it has a huge benefit. Well, uh, what, so what, is, what you is your PhD? Uh, what is your PhD course? I didn't understand it. Site specific installations. Ah, okay. <laughs> yes, <okay. laughs> I didn't know that I was hitting right into your uh, field of interest. So I'm glad to hear. Maybe you have a question. So, um, maybe after, if I can contact you after uh, the end of the lecture, it would be great. Well, well, thank you very yes. much. Um, I think we can uh, end the stream now. Thank you. And uh, yeah, thank you very much. I